So guys, let's welcome Chester Elton, uh, author, executive coach, keynote speaker, and develop an all-in culture and engage <laughs> your people. So that's that's Chester for all of you. And uh, that's, that's the book that uh, I grabbed like two weeks ago and uh, that caught my attention and it I, I so much connected with this book Chester and I thought you know to invite you and let the audience as well to have your wisdom so thank you so much for accepting it accept, accepting the invite and being on the show well thanks so much for the invitation you know it's always good to spend time with good people I loved your previous speaker she says you know when you get down and whatnot surround yourself with good people so it's morning for me, it's evening for you, and we've surrounded ourselves with good people. So what a, what a great way to, to spend some time. Well, listen, uh, JJ, I want to keep you involved in the conversation. So uh, I can't see you, but you will be the voice of God, which is yep. great. <laughs> and and uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a conversation. Sure. As well as, if you will, I can't see the, uh, the, the chat box when I present. So if there are questions that come up, I don't hesitate so. to interrupt and uh, we can have the conversation. Sure. Well, listen, we are without doubt living in unusual times. And uh, my co-author, Adrian Gostick, and I, we've spent an inordinate amount of time uh, studying cultures and studying what creates a great workplace and what are the attributes of great leaders. And before I get going, I, I just want to say thank you so much to JJ for inviting me, the JJ School of Employability, what a noble mission enhancing people and putting good things in people's lives. So thank you very much for that in invitation one more time. Thank you so much. So this is my co-author, Adrian Gostick. Uh, he's the good looking one with a full head of hair. And uh, <laughs> I say I am a Robin to his Batman. Uh, we've been writing together now for 20 years. Here are samples of, of some of our books, uh, The Carrot Principle. Uh, for those of you who can see me, we have our mascot, The Carrot. This is Garrett the Carrot. We always say more carrots, fewer sticks. And it makes for a better way to lead and a better way to live. All In is our book around culture. What motivates me is our employee engagement book. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, motivators assessment that we've developed and, and a way that you can probably use that in your life. Best Team Wins is uh, one of our books. And then our latest book is Leading with Gratitude. And I want to spend a lot of time today on how putting gratitude at the center of how you develop yourself, how you lead yourself, and how you lead your families is, is really critical. And JJ, I want to ask you an interesting question. So yeah. I, I think we all understand what gratitude means. You know, mm. we're grateful for our family. We're grateful for friends. We're grateful for our jobs, whatever it might be. If I asked you to give a definition of the opposite of gratitude, what would your answer be? And you can't say ingratitude. That's too easy. Uh, I would say not being thankful for what I have. Not being thankful. I would love you all to put something in the chat box. Okay. So what you think the chat right now? Uh, no. I, I, I cannot. When I'm sharing my screen, I can only see my slides, unfortunately. Oh, got it. No one see. So, uh, so let's, let's have a bit of a conversation around gratitude, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I want to move on and talk about the elements of a great culture. So... We looked at a massive uh, database. In fact, Willis Towers Watson gave us access to 8 million global engagement surveys. And what we did is we distilled that down to the organizations that were two and three times better than their competitors, really over delivered. And we took about 300,000 of those engagement surveys and said, okay, what were the elements for great cultures. And here's our roadmap. Now, as, as we talk today, I, I'm going to talk to you about businesses that maybe have nothing to do with your experience or your career. Don't worry about that. Think about what are the principles and how can I share that uh, or how can I incorporate that into my life? Now, you'll see there's this define your burning platform. Your, your previous speaker talked a little bit about what, were your, what are your key motivators? Where is your passion? So I, lo I love to say not only just define your burning platform, what is your noble cause? Mm. Everybody gets the what and the how. Think a little bit about the why. You know, mm. why do you do what you do? A customer focus, which is so important. Let me back up here. Uh, but I'm, 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 we jumped too soon. Uh, customer focus, agility. And boy, never has there been a time when we've needed more agility than now right? Mm -hmm. We need to be able to pivot, reinvent, be, be uh, innovative. Sharing everything and partnering with your talent, 
this is the idea, and your previous speaker talked about finding mentors, surrounding yourself with good people, being very transparent in what you need and where you want to go. Uh, cheering for each other. I, I love this one. I, we never met a great leader, a great culture, a great team where they didn't celebrate their successes. Yeah. Again, back to, you know, more carrots, less sticks. <laughs> uh, establishing clear accountability becomes ever more important now. And we're going to talk very specifically about 360 degree or 200% accountability. Uh, in the core of the roadmap is we need to engage, enable, and energize ourselves. We need to engage, enable, and energize the people around us. So looking at that roadmap, JJ, is there anything there that you, that you see that really pops out that is meaningful to you? So in the current scenario, uh, just I would say developing agility, if you could uh, talk about in the current scenario, you could talk a little about how uh, relevant and important it is and how can one develop uh, that space a little. You know, I, uh, I, I will. We'll get into that in, in, in a little later in the presentation. I'm glad you highlighted that because never has there been more of an opportunity mm. to reinvent, to pivot, and to be, to be agile. And I'll talk to you very specifically about a couple of companies that one in the last recession uh, pivoted very, very well. And a case study that we're working on right now in real time. So I'm glad you pointed that out, JJ. So what is the definition of a winning culture? It's an organization where people believe what they do matters and they can make a difference, right? And I always say, when, when you make a difference, it's noticed and it's celebrated. I think this encapsulizes a lot of what we're talking about, that there's a belief that work is important. Uh, that I'm important and that I can connect the dots to what I do into realizing that goal, whatever that might be. Now, in tough times, and uh, JJ, see if you agree with this, I, I, I honestly believe that it's in the hardest times that the greatest leaders are forged. In other words, when you think of great leaders, you know, Gandhi, for example, Gandhi wasn't forged as a great leader because everything was going great, right? Yeah. He was forged in a very critical time. You know, it, it, it's a war. It's a recession. In your families, think about the times where you really developed as a person. Yeah. I guarantee you it was the hard times, not the good times. And, Absolutely. and I, I want to know, JJ, has there been a particular tough time in your life where you have really had to bear down and where that tough time made you a better person? Absolutely. I, I, and when you talked about it, about family, that, that instance immediately popped up in my mind. And I thought, oh my God, I did not think about it. You know? Yeah. So, you, yeah. You know, we have four children, right? And mm -hmm. uh, when I look at the children that made me a better father and a better husband and a better parent, they were the kids that gave me the hardest time. <laughs> they were the ones that really tested me, you know? It was like, ah! you know, I'd, I'd uh, you know, you, you have those moments as a parent where you think, you know, I, could I make it look like an accident? You know, could I actually just kill them? That would solve all my problems, right? And yet it's in those hard times when you really have to bear down and say, okay, what kind of a father do I want to be? What kind of a parent do I want to be? Those lessons absolutely translate into your business life. And in these hard times, how do I want to be remembered is a great question. How do I want to be remembered as a teammate, as an employee, as a manager? It's tough times that make us really who we are. So uh, what to do? So we're in this pandemic. You know, we're not going to eliminate the COVID-19 virus. It's gone global. You know, uh, bird flu was contained. Ebola, it was contained. It was able to be eliminated. This is now like the flu. You know, we never get rid of the common cold. We'll never get rid of the flu. It's in too many places. Yeah. So we're not talking about elimination anymore. We're talking about mitigation. Yeah. So the idea here is how do we develop the new social protocols? Hmm. You know, I lived uh, for two years when I was a young man in Italy. It doesn't surprise me that Italy, they transfer. I mean, they kiss, they slap, they hug, they spit, they yell at each other. I mean, it's, it's all right here, right? Yeah. How is that going to change society in Italy? How is that going to change society in India on our social distancing? When we go to restaurants, when we go to movies, how we interact with each other. And so when you think about, you know, not only your personal life, think about your business. Yeah. 
And this is where that 200% accountability comes in. I can hold myself accountable. You know, I can wear a mask. I can wear safety goggles. I can wear gloves. I can do my social distancing in my personal life and at work. When someone doesn't do that, am I, am I strong enough? I'm, am I empowered to call them on it and to hold them accountable and for it to be okay to do that? Hey, just quick reminder, JJ. Yeah. You know, you're a little too close. Mm. Uh, quick reminder, JJ. Uh, you need to put on your mask. Mm. Yeah, and mm. so on. You see what I'm saying? Mm. And then how do we keep our customers safe yeah. so that they feel good about coming into our place of business or coming online? You know, with Zoom now, you've got these guys bombing in and putting up ridiculous things, you know. Mm. Mm. You know, I don't know who these knuckleheads are, JJ, <laughs> and I don't know how they think that by doing that, they're making the world a little better place or making themselves better. Yeah. And yet they're there and yeah. we need to deal with that. How do we keep our chat room safe? How do we keep our online safe? And then what are the new options? I mean, you're doing a brilliant job here. And in the new options, isn't it wonderful that I can be just outside New York City mm. and you can have all these wonderful people that are joining us from all over India. Mm. And yet we're talking in real time. I mean, it's remarkable. Yep. You know, if we were to say, hey, I want you to come speak at a conference, I'd say, okay, well, I got to get on a plane. You know, mm. I'm going to lose two days. I'm going to lose a, an inordinate amount of sleep. Mm. And sure, we can have a great conversation. And I hope that that happens again. And I hope mm. someday I jump on a plane and you and I get to meet face to face. Absolutely. <laughs> in the meantime, there is a lot we can do in real time, in video, globally. And so as you take a look at, it's mitigation. It's the new social protocols. It's accountability. 200%, 360 degree, whatever you want to call it. The new way we engage with our customers. And so does, does all this make sense to you, JJ? Absolutely, yeah. Is there anything that's popping out in particular in the, in the chat uh, about whether it be mitigation or accountability? Is there anything popping up there? Uh, not, not really. Okay, great. Well, let's move on then. One of the case studies that uh, is one of my favorites is a WD-40. Have you got a can of WD-40 somewhere in your house, JJ? No. <laughs> well, WD-40 is this, it is an iconic global brand, okay. right? It stands for Water Displacement 40. It's, if you've got a squeaky hinge, you get WD-40. Okay. You know, if, it, if it's not moving and it should move, <laughs> WD-40 is, is what you want to look at. Okay. So the idea with WD-40 was in the last recession, and that's, by the way, that's Gary Ridge, their CEO, delightful guy. Okay. Gary says, look, I'm visiting all our research facilities and traveling all over the world. And my employees keep coming up to me and they keep saying, hey, Gary, are you okay? And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I said, no, Gary, really, are you, are you okay? He said, everywhere I went, I got the same questions. So I called my wife at the end of the day. I said, honey, do I look sick? Like, do I, do I look unwell? Why are people asking me all these questions? And she said, Gary, they're not asking, are you okay? They're asking, are we going to be okay? Mm -hmm. Because everywhere their friends are telling them about businesses going out of business, people getting laid off, reduced hours, and they're afraid. Mm -hmm. And so he said, oh, I get it now. So I love this quote. He says, I told my people, let's not waste a good crisis. <laughs> mm. Isn't that a great attitude? We're in crisis. Let's not waste a good crisis. Everywhere people are hearing about the horror, they're hearing about bad news. When they come to work here, they're going to hear about hope and good news. Mm. So, you know, I think now in particular, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, be the good news. You know, if you look, look, if you want bad news, it's, that's easy to find. And that's easy to find. You know, mm -hmm. just turn on your phone, look at your news feed. Look for the good news. Be the good news in what we're talking about. He says, look, in a crisis, here are our rules. No lying, no faking, no hiding. Right? We're going to communicate every day. We're going to mm -hmm. focus on our people. It's development and research. He said, look, our finances are in good shape. We're not going to lay anybody off. And we're going to put gratitude at the core of what we do. Now, here's why it's so important to communicate every day, whether it's with your family, your friends, at work. And, and here's your skill testing question, JJ. When there is no information, where, where do you tend to go? Do you tend to go to the positive or the negative? When there's no? 
Yeah, when there's a gap, when there's no news, all of a sudden everybody's gone quiet. Do you assume the best or do you assume the worst? Uh, I think the worst. I'll, I'll not be positive. Yeah, and why is that? Why do we always go to the negative? Why are we wired that way? Why do you think? Uh, maybe because of uh, what we have seen in the media, whatever is coming up is not positive. Maybe because of that. I, I think you're right. You know, in, in the gap, in mm. the void, negativity goes in. And for a couple of reasons. One is, is that our, our brains are always looking for danger. We're always looking to protect ourselves. Mm. So we're not asking ourselves, hey, what's, what could go right? You know, mm. we're always asking mm. ourselves, what could go wrong? Yeah. And when there's a void, when there is a gap, we go to that negativity. Mm. And so it's really important to keep that communication up. Focus on people development. Focus mm. on the core, uh, core values tied to gratitude. So here's what happened as they come out of the recession, 2010, right? Record earnings. 99% employee wow. engagement. Globally, the average is about 33% and mm. a 300% increase in market cap. Mm. So here is a case study of, of a very simple product. It's, it's lubricant, it's oil, right? Yeah. And yet through those tough times, they were able to engage, enable and energize their people and, and, and see ridiculous and historic results. Well, this case study, and along with many others, we put in our book, All In. Largest study ever conducted, 300,000 engagement surveys in a global study from Willis Towers Watson. Now, it's really interesting. We said, look, how do, you, how do cultures get people to be engaged in tough times? The core of the roadmap, you'll remember, is to engage, enable, and energize. Okay? And, and again, your team, your organization, and you personally. So what, is that, what does that mean? Engagement is this ability to give discretionary effort, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm engaged around the noble cause. I believe what we do matters, right? Mm -hmm. And that we can make a difference. Enabled is I have the tools and the training to actually get the job done. When you talk about disengagement, nothing will disengage people faster than not being able to have the time or the tools mm -hmm. to get things done. And energy, again, what is my noble cause? How am I getting to where I need to go? Here are the, are the results. Now, we work on a very simple premise, JJ. We look at the data, we look mm -hmm. at the case studies, and then we give you tools. The case studies, the data we're taking a look at, this is data that says, look, if you have high engagement, operating margins go up. If you add enablement and energy, your productivity can double. Now, on the personal side, take a look and say, look, how am I, how am I personally enabling myself? How am I energizing myself? Again, you know, your previous presenter talked about what, what, am I, what am I doing that gets me motivated, that gets me excited yeah. about what I'm doing? Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then, you know, am I surrounding myself with the tools and the wherewithal? I loved her advice on finding mentors and mm. finding a coach, someone that you can go to for good advice. Absolutely. Well, so let, let's look at engagement here really quick. Opportunity, trust, and pride. Those were the top three drivers of engagement. Alignment was, was a, a big part of, of driving pride. In other words, we keep our promises. Communication is trust. And again, can you over communicate? I think in times of crisis, you really can't. Mm. It really is about how are we doing now? And I think that's a very important question. You know, when you're calling friends and family, you're calling coworkers, the question isn't how are you doing? Mm. It's how are you doing now? Because, you know, you can go from ridiculously optimistic to absolutely terrified, right, mm. yeah. in, 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 in a minute. And so the question is, how are you doing now? And then look at opportunity and well-being. The number one driver is someone noticed and appreciated me. Mm. In fact, it was the number two driver of trust and pride. So, again, this power of gratitude, the power of the simple thank you is not lost in all of this data. Well, it brings us to our new research in our new book, Leading with Gratitude. Eight leadership practices for extraordinary business results. Now, we asked people what was the opposite of gratitude. Did we get some good feedback on that in the chat box? Yeah, let me read out to you. Perfect. So, it is... Uh, 
ones. Being selfish, discontentment. Being selfish, I like that one. Discontent. Self-absorbed. Oh, that's a good one. Self-absorbed. <laughs> yes. You know, it's all about me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and unsatisfied. Unsatisfied. You know, some as we asked various leaders, you know, they said, you know, indifference is is the opposite. Also asked uh, entitlement being yeah. part of that. You know, if I'm entitled to it, why would I be grateful? You know, one leader that I talked to, go ahead, another one? Yeah, there's fear, em no empathy, self-obsessed, complaining, all these are uh, the ones. Good, good. And thank you for your engagement. Thank you for your comments. Okay. So it really interesting, you know, I was talking to one leader and I said, what do you think the opposite of gratitude is? And he says, oh, geez, I don't know, Chess. Being a jerk. <laughs> 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 and I love that comment. Well, leading with gratitude, it's really important, you know, as leaders, and we're all aspiring to be good leaders, right? To master the art of engaging hearts and minds in people, focusing on the right behaviors. And that last one, don't, uh, don't disregard that, keeping hope alive, making mm -hmm. sure that there's hope. So we talk about gratitude 101. You know, in university, you take your, your courses. Alan Mulally is a leader that I've gotten to know and remarkable in that you might remember in the last recession, auto automakers in the U.S. were in desperate times, yeah. right? General Motors and Chrysler and so on. Ford Motor Company was the company that didn't take the government bailout. Mm -hmm. And they brought in Alan Mulally from, from Boeing, actually. And he said, look, uh, leadership is about people. It's about appreciating, appreciating them, loving them, and thanking them every step of the way. And this is really important to find small wins. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, it's really interesting. And, and I love, he's, he's got this wonderful American accent. And he says, Jess, it's all about your people. Love them up. Love them up. You know, engage your people and love them up. Here's what's really interesting. He said, look, when he took over at the Ford Motor Company, now you remember WD-40, 99% yep. engagement. Global engagement is around 33%. He came into the Ford Motor Company at 20% engagement. In other words, only about two out of every 10 people really were excited to come to work. They had all these disparate brands, you know, Volvo, Jaguar, Range Rover, and so on. And they were on track to lose, to lose $17 billion that year, oh. that year. Mm. So he says, yeah, I came in in the summer. He says, we're on track to lose $17 billion. And in November, of that year, we realized that goal. <laughs> we lost $17 billion. So what do you do? So again, this 200% accountability. He said, look, I bring all my leaders in and it was a very simple process. If your project is on track, it's green. If, if you've got a plan, you're not there yet, it's yellow. And if you've got problems and you can't get there, it's red. Red, yellow, green, right? Mm -hmm. And I love this in your personal life, in your life plan review. Put down, you know, what are your projects? Where are you going? And how am I doing? And hold yourself personally accountable. Later today, I have a group. There's six of us. And every week we check in with each other. How are you doing? How is your life plan review? Which I think mm -hmm. is, and you know, you, you know this, JJ, when you bring other people into your planning and they hold you accountable, you're more likely to do it. You've got a mentor that holds you accountable. You've got a trainer that holds you accountable. You've got a spouse. You've got your kids, right? Mm -hmm. They'll all hold you. Put it in a grid like this. Mm -hmm. So here's what's really interesting. First meeting. Now, understand, this is a company hemorrhaging money. Yeah. It says, how are we doing? Everybody's was green. He said, okay, it's going to take them a while to learn the process. Second week, everything's green. Third week, everything's green. Finally, he says, look, time out. You know, we just lost $17 billion, right? If everything's green... How come we're losing $17 billion, right? <laughs> finally, Mark Fields finally puts up a red. And he goes, that's great. He says, look, it's, it's, it, we have a problem. You are not the problem. You see, sometimes with ourselves and where we work, we think that because they're a problem that we are the problem. We are not the problem. We have a problem. Let's solve the problem, right? WD-40 stands for water displacement 40th formula. 
right? It took him 40 tries to get to the right formula. He says, we don't have mistakes. We have learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And see, when you look at stuff like that and you say, look, we've made a mistake. Let's learn from it, move on. We've got a problem. Let's solve the problem, move on. Nobody's worrying about how does this make me look? How does this make me feel, right? Mm -hmm. And as soon as they, as soon as they got over that hurdle, yeah. good things started to happen. He said, look, we're going to focus on small wins. When that guy finally put up the red box, everybody mm. thought the guy's career is over. Mm. He said, no, 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 no. Put mm. up the red box. And he started to clap. He said, <laughs> now let's solve the problem. Let's solve the problem. Yeah. Let's stay optimistic. And versus just spotting problems, let's find small wins. And I know personally this can be tough, you know, particularly now. You know, everybody's sheltering in place. You can't go outside. Look for small wins. Hey, I got up on time today. <laughs> oh, I showered. I, I, I got, I got, you know, I have a friend, Peter Bregman, who's an executive coach, and he's brilliant. And he says, look, it's harder to get things done, particularly if you have a lot of kids at home, right? Pick one thing that you want to get done today. And if you get that one thing done, celebrate that. Celebrate that. That's a victory. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, JJ? Absolutely. One comment in the comment section is when everything is green, only then we have to understand what we lack in developing. Exactly. Oh, that is such an insightful comment. Yes. Thank Lachin. you very much. Yeah, that's it. Vijay because, Lachin. Yeah. Because you don't want everything to be green. If everything's green, you're, you haven't set the right goals. You should always be pushing yourself to do more. Yeah. You know, if your grid is absolutely very insightful, if it's all green, you got to change your goals. There should always be yellow. There should always be red. I love that. Well, go ahead. Any more? And additionally, she says, then we are we are wearing a mask. Then, if, if everything is a green, then we are wearing a mask. You got to wear yes. that mask. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Be true to yourself. Well, <laughs> let's speed things up here because we want to leave plenty of time for questions. Eight leadership experiments we we talk about. So, how can you be the good news? How can you be the one that gets things done in a positive way? Now, I, I want to take a moment here. A lot of people think that expressing a lot of gratitude is a soft skill and that it's not an important skill because it's a soft skill. Alan Mulally, by the way, is one of the most demanding leaders. Gary Ridge, one of the most demanding leaders you'll ever meet. They get stuff done. And the way they get stuff done is they make sure they celebrate the small wins along the way that they encourage people along the way. This is not a nice to have skill. This is an absolute must have skill. And here's how you do it, right? This is 20 years of, of, of research. This is over a million engagement surveys and on and on. This is rock solid. First off is seeing and then expressing. So in seeing, am I seeing what's going on? Am I acting and soliciting on input? And it, whether it's at work or in your personal life, you've got personal goals. Am I listening to what people are telling me. I love mm. these sessions that you're putting on JJ. Mm. Am I taking good notes? Am I holding myself accountable? Mm. Assuming positive intent rather than assume negative intent. When there is a lack of news, let's look for the good news. Mm. Walking in other people's shoes. Understand that they, these are hard times for everyone, mm. right? Don't jump to the negative. And again, we've talked about looking for small wins. In expressing, give gratitude now. Give it often. Don't be afraid right? Don't be afraid that maybe you're not doing it right. That's fine. Just do it. Your previous uh, speaker, I love he goes, just do it. Right? Just get him, just do it. <laughs> Tailor your gratitude to the individual. Reinforce those core values and make it peer to peer. Let me jump through here really quick and get onto the, the next the concepts. Look for small wins we've talked about. I don't know if you've ever been bowling, JJ. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it's great fun, right? So at university, I needed a half a credit of PE to graduate mm -hmm. <laughs> in my university. And bowling was half a credit. So, you know, we, first day we're grabbing, we're firing the balls down the lane, we're knocking over the pins. The professor comes over and says, look, you don't aim for the pins. You aim for the arrows. If you hit the arrows, you'll hit the pins. In other words, set the short-term goals. And as you hit more short-term goals, You'll hit your long-term goals. A good friend of ours that is the president of a football club up in Canada, Toronto FC, when he took over Toronto FC, they had never made the knockout round. They'd never won the championship. And it was his job to turn around the culture. Well, 
2014, he comes in and he rallies his, his, his staff and he says, why do you do what you do? And the staff says, well, I mow the lawns. Well, I wash the, the uniforms. Well, I, I cook the food in the cafeteria. Said, no. What we all do, everything we do every day is so that we can win a championship. That's why we do it. And mm. everyone was laser focused. His first year there, they made it to the knockout tournament. Second year, they actually made it to the championship. Third year, they won the championship. Fourth year, they missed the playoffs. Last year, they were back in the championship again. And you can see him celebrating there when mm -hmm. you are focused. Um, I think this is really interesting. He also did uh, something I think is very clever. He built trophy cases for all the trophies they hadn't won yet. <laughs> now, I think in personal development, it's so important to do that. Create your trophy cases for maybe the degree you haven't achieved yet. It keeps it top of mind. Yeah. For the job that you want to get, it keeps it top of mind. For the project that you want to complete. And when you have those visuals in front of you, it keeps it top of mind. Does that make sense to you, Jay? Yeah, yeah. I, I go back to 2016 when I wrote my first book, How to Get That Job. And uh, the mentor, Dr. Atreya, he said, Yugesh, create a dummy book before you write it. Create a <laughs> dummy of the book. I said, what is the importance of create a dummy book before I write? He said, it will give you motivation. I so much relate to what just said. I love that. You know, and, and come up with the title and create the cover, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and practice your acceptance speech for the book of the year. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. All those little things that make so much make it so much fun. Well, number five on the list is praise efforts, reward results. A lot of times we think, oh, I'll remember to say thank you later. I love the analogy of the banana. You won't remember later. That's why it's so important to do it now. Gratitude doesn't keep. And the closer the, the gratitude is to the moment, the more impact it has, you know? And we know this with our kids. We know this with our friends. You know, it's so funny. I have leaders that go, well, um, I'll cheer and I'll reward you when we, when we actually achieve the goal. They say, okay, well, that's one way of looking at it. So I'm willing to bet, uh, JJ, that you have a sports team that you cheer for. Am I right? Yeah. What, what team is that? That is for cricket, I do India. Okay, for, for, for cricket, the national team, India, right? Yeah. yeah. So when you're, when you're watching it on TV or are you actually, actually at the match, do you say to yourself, you know what? I'll cheer for my team when they have won. Like, I'm going to wait till the end of the game. <laughs> and when I see the final score, if you've won, <laughs> I'm cheering for you. Is that what you do? No, 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 absolutely not. When do you start to cheer for the national cricket team? So as soon as they start, when they take a wicket, when they score a six, when they do a four run, you know, every time I do that. I, I'd be willing to bet that you even start cheering on your way to the match, right? Yeah. Before the match even starts, you're cheering yeah. for your team. Yeah, yeah. There's a great lesson there in mm -hmm. life. We cheer through everything. We cheer through everything. You know, it was really interesting. There was a survey done of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And they were asked, do you know how to ride a bike? Let's put this in the chat room. How many people do you think responded? Give me a number, not a, a percentage. Out of 10,000 people said, I do not know how to ride a bike. Okay. And, and call up the numbers and I'll tell you if you're high or low. Yes. What's your guess, JJ, out of 10,000 people? And majority would say yes. So, No, how many people do not know how to ride a bike? Give me a number, not a percentage. Maybe 50 or 100 of them. Yeah, 50 is high. Keep going. Keep guessing. Uh, zero? <laughs> zero? Zero is low. <laughs> 10 is high, right? Okay. It's, it's actually five, the answer is five. Three. Five is high. Three, three. Three! Congratulations, we have a winner. <laughs> <laughs> three people. See, it's really interesting. And, and what, the sur what the survey really wanted to get to was not did you know how to ride a bike. They wanted to know how did you learn how to ride a bike. Mm. And you might remember your mom and dad put you on the bike and they're running next to you. Keep yes. pedaling. Yes. You went further than last time. Hey, you missed the curb. Hey, that doesn't look like it'll need a trip to hospital, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're praising effort. 
right? Mm -hmm. Praising, mm -hmm. praising effort, rewarding results. Now, this guy here, he's trying hard, right? Oh, and he doesn't always get the results. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to praise that effort, however, because you, you want him to try again, right? Mm -hmm. And when you win, you get the trophy. Now, JJ, I grew up in Canada. So as big a cricket fan as you are is how big a hockey fan I am. Mm -hmm. Ice hockey in Canada is not a way of life. It's way more important than that, right? It's not life or death. It's way more important than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a religion. It's way more important than that. This is my hockey team, the New Jersey Devils, and we won the championship. Now, I tend to think that is the greatest trophy in all of sports because if you look at the trophy see how they put their names on that trophy yeah every player that's ever won the stanley cup has I his name i can see that yeah yeah now this is probably more what you're talking about right ah <laughs> you got it right <laughs> <laughs> and i love i love cricket by the way and by the way i've never been to a live match in india so you and i need to set a goal Absolutely. Before I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm going to go to a cricket match with you in India. Absolutely. Done deal. Okay. Now, tailor it to the individual. You know, uh, people receive praise different ways. Uh, great stories about me and my co-author. We'd written our first New York Times bestselling book, The Carrot Principle. We were working for a bigger company at the time. And I said, hey, let's celebrate our book with all the salespeople. So we had a big annual sales conference, company, salespeople coming from all around the world, you know, uh, guest speakers, uh, dinner, you know, lots of engagement and awards, right? Mm. And I noticed that my co-author, Adrian, didn't wear a watch. So I thought, well, let's get a really cool watch. Now, if you look at this watch, you might remember this was the watch that the guys in the movie Men in Black wore. It's the Men in Black watch. Really cool, right? So, and I love watches and I love conferences and I love hanging out with the salespeople. Mm. We get there and um, I notice Adrian's not having much of a good time. I said, Adrian, come on, let me introduce you to guys from England and the guys from Canada. It's so fun. He goes, Chess, I hate these things. I said, what? Mm. I, said, I hate these. I would much rather be with my family. I would much rather go to a, a dinner with my family. Mm. And he says, I really appreciate the watch. You know the reason I don't wear watches? I hate watches. <laughs> so here I was. I was projecting what I loved onto Adrian. Now, mm. he still has that watch, and it's still in the box. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so find out what it is. Is it cricket? Is it tickets mm. to a match? Is it tickets to a movie? Is it, a, is it time with their family? And make it personal. Now, what motivates me? This is, this is kind of fun because we, this was based on an 850,000-person uh, database. We developed our own motivators assessment. Yeah. And it takes you about 20 minutes to take. It tells you, you know, are you an, an achiever, a builder, a caregiver, reward driven, right? It lists them, you know, is family high for you? Is your top seven are strong, your middle seven are moderate, your bottom nine are neutral. Mm. And it's really interesting. It's, it's a great way to build your team and to build yourself. We did a, a study with Wendy's, you know, the fast food restaurant. Yeah, And she put her team and herself, this is Diane Weed at the front and then her direct reports. And they said, where do we have areas of disconnect? See, her team was all about learning. She'd been doing it for 30 years. Learning was low for her. Mm. And the team wanted more of her to be a mentor, which was easy for her because developing others was important. Mm. So knowing key motivators, it also helped their team on assignments. And for you personally, where do I want to work? Where do my motivators line up with the organization's core values? Yeah. And where we have disconnects, you know, pressure. Mm. If it's a high pressure job and pressure is low for me, that's probably yeah. not a good place for me to be. Now, what I would love to do, and this is my gift for those of you that are attending, if you would like to take this assessment, all you have to do is go to thecultureworks.com and right, right at the front, this is our training company. Just put in your name and your email. We will email you a code and you can take the motivators assessment. In fact, it'll ask you how many codes do you want? And if you want to use it for your family, if you want to use it for friends, if you want to use it for your own personal development, feel free to go ahead and take as many motivators assessments as you want. We, we sell them all the time. We thought during the virus, 
let's give them away. We've already given away probably 300,000 American dollars worth of uh, motivators assessment. And I would love to build up our database in India. So please feel free to, to jump on and, uh, and grab a motivators assessment. Thank you so much for that. You bet. And you know what, JJ, if you could just, just put that. Um, I've, I've done that. <laughs> in, the, in the chat box. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. So, you know, in a review, you know, seeing and then expressing, reinforcing the core values, making it peer to peer and so on on the expressing. Assume positive intent and work for, look for small wins, I think are really key right now. You know, it's easy to find the bad. Let's, let's look for the positive. Let's be the good news, right? Yeah. And then lastly, take it home. And we're going to wrap up here and then we're going to open it up uh, to questions and you and I can, can chat as long as, as you like. But this idea of we never met a great leader, we never met a great employee that didn't take gratitude home. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of our book, Leading with Gratitude, we have 13 ideas. And I want to share some of them with you. Uh, I love three things at dinner. Right. There's nothing better than having dinner with family. Right, JJ? Yes. And, and, and I know in India, food is such a big part of your culture, you yeah. know. And, yeah. and, and by the way, I love Indian food. I've gone, I've gone vegan. And there's one restaurant you can go to and one kind of food that you can get lots of good vegan food. It's Indian food. Yeah. yeah. So a friend of mine, he said, look, we've got two kids. We're having dinner, you know, and the conversation at dinner was never very engaging. Mm. We'd say, how was school? They'd say, fine. What did you learn? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, so we changed it. We said, look, you have to answer three questions. Number one, tell me about the best part of your day. Number two, tell me about someone that you're grateful for today that is not at the table. And three, tell me about somebody you're grateful for who is at the table who has not been thanked yet. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And he said it changed everything. Mm. Everybody got to brag about their day. Everybody got to talk about a friend or someone that they're grateful for. And someone at the table was made to feel special. Yeah. So I challenge you to do it. He said, you know, initially my kids were like, oh, dad, oh, dad. That's another one of those crazy things you always do. He said, then it got really engaging. And I knew it was great when they'd bring a friend to dinner and they'd say, now you're going to have to answer three questions. <laughs> Don't embarrass me. Have good answers. Right? <laughs> What's your best part of your day? Who are you grateful for? And on and on. Another one of the 13 that I love is teach your kids and teach your family to serve together. Right? Uh, we can be of tremendous service right now. There's elderly people in our neighborhoods. There's people that need food delivered or whatever it might be. People that are lonely. Call them. Zoom with them. You know, make them feel valued. Uh, ask them, how are you doing now? What can I do to help? And teach your kids to give. Teach your kids to give. You know, give of their time, give of their talents. I find that, you know, when we give, we receive. And the more we give, the more that we receive. Any of these resonate with you, uh, yep. JJ? So I was uh, other day sharing with you, even on the LinkedIn chat, when we were interacting about your book and how uh, my six-year-old, you know, before, uh, you know, we sleep for almost like almost six to eight months. There's one practice that I have incorporated. I don't know. I didn't knew that gratitude is of such importance after, you know, going through your book. I realized a lot of uh, about it. I said, you know, what is it that you're really grateful for? And after three, four, five days, he told me that, why are you asking me every day what I'm grateful for? <laughs> you know, how can I be grateful for every day? But now after six months, I realize he's become a different person altogether. Isn't that fascinating? I, you know, yeah. I, I love that you do that. Good for you, Jay. We should give a virtual clap. Everybody oh. virtual clap. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, it's such a simple thing and yet such a dramatic impact. Mm -hmm. My wife and I have a wonderful practice. At the end of the day, we say, what are your three? Mm. And, you know, often it's, it's more than three, you know, that we were able to go for a walk today, that we were able to do things together, that we saw the grandkids at a distance, right, that we Zoomed with them and so on. Well, there's a, there's a chat in the comments. Uh, uh, there's a comment for you, which is important, giving gratitude or the law of attraction. You know, I love, I love that because I have a theory and I believe it to be true 
that gratitude attracts gratitude. Positive people attract positive people. And I think the more that you give of yourself and the more gratitude you put out there, the more gratitude that comes back. So I think they're, 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 they're intimately connected, right? Mm, yeah. And, uh, and I think that's, that's such a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so let's open it up to discussion. And then I've got one story to, to wrap up. You know, we're going we're gonna to finish a little early. No one ever complains when a meeting end, ends early. I found that, <laughs> that to be true. So are there any questions? Are there anything? Yes, there are a lot of questions. Let, let me actually stop share so I can uh, see in the chat room and so on. Sure. So okay, there's, interestingly, there's one participant who says that, uh, one second, let me read that out for you. Uh, Krishan Jaga, he says, I've attended a couple of lectures in person in the US and yes. brought the book Gratitude. Definitely worth buying. That's what he says. <laughs> Excellent. Do you know, there's another website, um, and, I, and I'll grab it and, and pop it in. We have a website for the book, actually, leadingwithgratitudebook.com. And, and um, I'm going to um, put it in the chat line right here. We, uh, we actually have a bunch of free resources that you can use. Let me pop it in right here, right now. And um, there's some fun videos. You can download the first chapter. You can read the, uh, the forward to the book written by my dear friend, uh, Marshall Goldsmith. And it really is, um, it really is inspiring. And, and, and then if you'd like to order the book, there's lots of places you can order the book as well. You know, you can download Kindle, the digital, and so on. I'd really encourage you to, to uh, take some time and watch the, the, the videos. The foreword in particular, uh, we're very proud of. Our, our friend Marshall Goldsmith wrote it. And you know what he said? He said, you know, whether you are rich or poor, whether you're in India or America, he said, you know what? We all have one thing in common. Mm. And it's this, that we want to be happy. And it's so true, isn't it? We all want to yeah. be happy. And the happiest people I have ever met are people that live and express gratitude mm. deeply. They put it at the center of everything they do. Yeah. They're grateful for their health. They're grateful for their friends. They're grateful for their family. And we want to be around grateful people. And you know, uh, a great question here from Anjana that says, what's the biggest change brought about by the pandemic? I, I think people are really focusing on the simple things that they're grateful for. And we have hopefully become more grateful for the simple things. Yeah. And I hope that when the pandemic is over, that that will continue, that we'll continue to look out for our neighbors yeah. and call friends and family and those that are lonely. Yeah. I love in the forward. Uh, let's keep, let's be happy now, not later. Exactly. That was, that was profound. I mean, you know, it's always, we're looking for it. But we, we also have a choice to be happy now. So that is something that was, you know, very profound in the book when I started yeah. reading. And, and you know what? There's, there is one opinion here. It says gratitude stops you from moving on, though the present status is not, uh, is not great. I don't think gratitude stops you from moving on. I no. think gratitude creates po more possibilities mm. as you start to express that gratitude. And I think gratitude, it, it actually can heal you. And, and let me explain that. A good friend of mine, Dave Kirpin, he says, look, when I'm in a bad mood, so you, know, you, you need to pull yourself out of it. He says, I have this personal exercise that I do. He says, uh, I take two minutes. I set the timer on my smartphone for two minutes. And I go into the notes section. And I start typing in the names of all the people that I love and that mm -hmm. are important to me. And after two minutes, he says, I'm healed. I'm mm -hmm. able, I'm more positive. I'm able to move on. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I want to give everybody right now a challenge and I can't see you all. It's fine. I, I want you to grab your smartphone and I want you to text somebody that you love. Yeah. And okay. I want you to just text them a simple message thinking about you. I want you to know how much I love you, how grateful I am that you are in my life. Wow. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm now I will tell you, JJ, we did this at a conference. Yeah. And it was really interesting. It was, it was in Las Vegas, right? You know, Las Vegas, lots yeah. of conferences. After, you know, we're doing a book signing. A woman comes up to me and says, I texted my daughter at university. Mm -hmm. And here's what she texted back. And it said, thank you, mom. I love you too. 
And she got kind of emotional. I said, well, that's a, that's a lovely message. She said, you don't understand. My daughter never says I love you, ever. She said, you, you can't believe how much this means to me. I said, isn't that lovely? Make that a practice. Make that a practice. Yeah. And then another gentleman comes up to me. He says, yeah, I did what you told me. I said, who did you text? He says, I texted my wife. And I said, honey, love you, thinking about you. And she said, you're in Las Vegas. What has happened? Why are you doing this? <laughs> what, what have you done? <laughs> I said, well, the more you do it, the less that will happen, right? And she'll yeah. appreciate it more. I have, I have a, a you know question in my mind which I want to ask. So when we practice this uh, gratitude, how much of it is important that we intensify that feeling and then do it? Or even if the intensity is low, we should practice it. Still, we should practice it. Yes, I, I think when it comes to uh, gratitude in particular, there are, are two words that are very important. It's be intentional and be disciplined. So, you know, I have a list of seven things that I try to do first thing every day. And they're very simple. You know, say my prayers, read my scriptures, do a stretch, you know, um, uh, have a good breakfast. You know, um, I, I try to write one thank you note every day to someone. I know I'm old school. You know, I've, I've got my, my, my stack of, of thank you cards here. And, and wow. I just once a day just say, look, it takes me two or three minutes. Often it's friends and family. Often it's somebody I've been on the phone with or, or we've been a con or has organized something like this. Mm. And, I, and I think those kinds of things are just simple little things, very intentional. At the end of the day, I want to end the day every day with my wife. What are your three? You know, people out there need encouragement now more than ever. Now more than ever. You know, good question says, what motivates me daily? You know, uh, my family is a tremendous motivator for me. I, mm. I, uh, I married an extraordinary woman. You know, um, my wife's name's Heidi. And, uh, you know, I said, look, every, every time I'm having a tough time, I, I think about how lucky I am to be married to Heidi, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, uh, and my kids, I have four extraordinary kids. Now they're not all extraordinary at the same time, right? <laughs> there's always there's always somebody who needs some help. Um, so my family, and I will tell you, probably more than anything, uh, is my faith. I, I really do believe we're part of something much bigger, wow. and that and that there uh, that I have uh, a heavenly Father that loves me and cares about me and knows me, and that uh, and that I am never alone. And so uh, for me, that is just a tremendous motivation every day that. I want to do things that that would honor him mm -hmm. and and that would you know help someone else have a little better day and it is so true j j that the more we give, the more we get you know there's a question about any meditation techniques in 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 my life uh, my prayers are my meditation i mm -hmm. I pray uh, morning uh, first thing in the morning, I pray over my food. And then I pray at the end of the day to give uh, thanks for the people in my life and and uh, and for the day that I've been able to live. There's one interesting question on uh, how did you started in becoming an author and uh, motivation speaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a completely by accident. Uh, by the way, I, uh, I I I grew up in sales. I loved selling, and I worked for a company that, where we sold recognition programs, which I thought was lovely. Yeah, and. Um, I called our CEO and said, you know, if we were thought leaders, you'd make my job easier. People would call us. I wouldn't have to call them. <laughs> and I said, thought leaders write books. And he said, I love it. Write the book. And I said, I, I'm not a writer. I'm a sales guy. And he said, you're a smart guy. Figure it out. Wow. I said, oh. So then I was playing with different ideas for a year. And then he called me back and he said, I've hired a writer. His name's Adrian Gostick. Write the book. So he challenged me. He thought well of me, and then he enabled me with Adrian, and mm. that energized me. So engage, enable, and energize, right? Yeah. And a year later, we wrote our first book called The 24 Carat Manager. Mm. Mm. Or no, it was Managing with Carrots. You'd think I'd know that. Managing with Carrots. And as, as we wrote the books and they got popular, people would say, do you speak on your books? And we said, sure, <laughs> we can yeah. do that. And then after we'd speak, people say, well, you have training, right? I said, yeah, we've got training. <laughs> um, so it was a virtuous circle. The more books we sold, the more we spoke, the more we trained, the more we trained, the more books we sold. And it's become a, a lovely circle. So it was, it was, uh, 
It what was not with, intentional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is with orange color? I see a lot of oranges. So, <laughs> yes, everything is orange. In fact, uh, excuse me, but I only wear orange socks. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, orange, you know, carrots are orange. Uh, orange is the color of, of uh, positivity. Yeah. You know, it's the it's the color of safety, uh, and on and on. And so it's become it's very easy for me to get dressed. I only have orange shirts. I only have orange socks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah. Well, great. Um, anything else I can do for anyone? I, we've got a few more minutes uh, left. Yeah. I have yes. a concluding your story. Question? I'd love to. We'll take one or two questions quickly. Sure. Do you think there's any connection between spirituality and gratitude? I do. I, I honestly do. I, I think when, you know, wh whatever it is that you do, whether it's a meditation or reflection, I, I, I do think, you know, it's really interesting. I, I love this question because I journal. I keep a journal. And um, I, I try to write in it every day. And it's simple reflection. I even put like tickets and pictures of family and stuff. It's more like a, a journal scrapbook, right? That's a hockey ticket, by the way, JJ. I got to get you to a hockey game, man. You and I'll, I'll get you to the cricket in That's India. Right. <laughs> hockey is like cricket, except they can punch each other, which I, it delights me. Anyway, um, this idea of spirituality and reflection being a part of uh, something bigger. And I think journaling is a really wonderful practice of reflection. Reflect on the day. Is, is, is very, very, very nice. So thank you for that question. So if you could repeat the lunch with family. Uh, the, oh, the three questions? The three questions. Yes. What was the best part of your day? Mm. Who are you grateful for who is not at the table? And who are you grateful for at the table who has not been thanked yet? Wow. That's so profound. Yeah. Great. So... I'd, I'd like to wrap up just with sure. a quick story, unless you've got a couple more questions you'd like to, to, to ask. Uh, thanks. Okay, perfect. We thanks can for go the with session. Questions. Yeah. Thank you, Shilpa. Um, you know, my father was a great uh, mentor to me, and he taught me many great lessons, and a few I'd like to share as we wrap up today. Yeah. One is he would say, you have to choose to be offended. And it's really interesting. The question here is, how do, you, how do you balance gratitude with anger? You know, he says, you have to choose to be offended. My father was great about saying thank you. And I'll tell you a cute story that exemplifies my father to a T. In, in our church, it's all volunteer. And so mm. my dad would volunteer to work with the youth, yeah. you know, young people. And he was very popular, very popular guy and happy guy. You know, gratitude attracts gratitude. Everybody wanted to be around my dad. Well, there's always that person who's the curmudgeon, the negative person, right? Mm. And we had one in our congregation. And she comes up to my dad one day and she literally says to him, you know, Mr. Elton, you think all the youth in our congregation, you think they just love you. Well, I'm here to tell you they don't. <laughs> <Just like that. laughs> and he did not take offense. Uh -huh. He said, well, thank you. And she said, it's not a compliment. And he said, too late, <laughs> too late. So he says, you have to choose to be offended. So I think a lot of times when we are angry, we choose to be angry. Mm. Find an outlet for that, you know, find a place to go and, and to reflect and take a deep breath. You know, I love, I've started to do a little yoga, you know, your breathing exercise, calm yourself down. Mm. Anger never solved anything. It never did. And my father would also say, Choose to be happy. That happiness is a choice. And I love that. The last lesson he shared with me that I want to share with you, and then I'd love to hear if anybody got their texts back, <laughs> is he said, you know what? Uh, one thing I love about my dad is the way he talked to people that were in the grocery store or in the parking lots or on the street and captains of industry. It was all the same. Everybody was important to my dad. Mm. And he taught me this one lesson. He said, you know, Chess, you be good to everybody. Everybody's having a tough day. Mm. And I think right now in the COVID-19, everybody's having a tough day. You know, nine out of 10 people you talk to, there's something going on. They're having, you know, they're, they're worried about an elderly parent. They're worried about, you know, their family. They're worried about their job. It, it costs nothing to be kind. Yeah. 
be be good to everybody. Everybody's having a tough day. I, I my rule of three is be grateful, be kind, and be sure to take it home. Well, wow. be grateful, be kind, and take it home. Wow. Well, as we wrap up, anybody get a good text back? I yeah, love you so too. Naveen says he got a text back. Uh, people are uh, so. A lot of people are saying that two of them have got the text back. My sis, mom, and wife replied back. I got a call back. <laughs> yeah, you got a call. I saw that. That was awesome. People on their phones. Good. Well, listen, a little daily dose of grat gratitude is a great way to live. It's a great way to lead. And I would encourage you, especially now in a crisis, lead with gratitude. Not only is it a great way to lead, it is an extraordinarily positive way to live. And that would be my blessing to you. I don't know a lot of Indian words. I do know this one. Thank you for your time. Namaste. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jester. <laughs> I really loved it. Thank you. Take care, JJ. I'm Thank off. You. Thank you for attending, everybody. Cheers. Yeah. Take care. Goodbye.